Thank you very much. So as is typical with National Press Foundation programs, we, when we're discussing an issue, we really like our journalists to be able to engage with the issue and the people who are affected by it. So we have assembled today a panel of people who are living with diabetes. Each of them has a slightly different story to tell. Uh, they're each going to speak for about five minutes, and then we will open the floor to questions. So I'll introduce all three of them, and then we'll go ahead and start with Lauren. Lauren is a Vice President of Public Affairs at Ketchum uh, Public Affairs Practice. Uh, Bill Lebovich, in the middle, is an architectural historian and photographer in the Washington area. He's currently working on a book. And Judy Mendel is a student at the George Washington School of Public Health and Health Services. She's working toward her Master's of Public Health. And she also, um, I'm sorry, previously lived in Manhattan and worked in account management for a number of advertising agencies. So we thank all of you for being here today and for being willing to share your stories. Uh, Lauren, we'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, moment. Let me make sure everyone can hear me. Um, I thought it would be helpful to just start with a little uh, background on you know my experience living with diabetes. Uh, I was uh, diagnosed with diabetes when I was two and a half years old. Uh, it was actually quite interesting. My parents had gone to Kenya on safari for their first vacation since I was born, and uh, they left and. My, uh, the babysitter noticed that I was going through diapers at a rather rapid rate, approximately one diaper an hour, and that continued for the three weeks that they were gone. My mom came home, took stock of what was uh, in front of her uh, for around 24 hours, and pretty much diagnosed me on the spot. As a little bit of background, my mother also has uh, type 1. Uh, she was diagnosed when she was around 20 years old. So I, it, I wouldn't say that growing up in our household with diabetes was easy, but it was at least a little um, more comfortable for our family, given that she had experience with it. Um, living with diabetes uh, in the early 80s was, uh, it was, it was an interesting time to be uh, you know, recently diagnosed. It was a time when a lot of uh, new treatments were introduced. I, I can still remember very clearly when I tested my blood sugar for the first time. I actually, I remember my parents were sitting in the, the bathroom and they just, um, you know, kind of were drawing me towards them and all of a sudden it was, you know, suddenly we did blood glucose testing right in front of everyone. Um, that was a little traumatizing as a, I guess it was a three-year-old, um, but you know it's something that just became a part of my daily life. Um, over the years, with um, the introduction of new types of insulin, um, it meant that I was taking shots more frequently. So I went from maybe two shots a day, um, you know, morning and night, to at I think the peak of before I went on the insulin pump, I think I was taking something like eight or ten shots a day, and it, uh, that was just a fact of life. You know, when you can't mix insulins, you're suddenly stuck with a lot of syringes and you become very comfortable with it. Um, you know, in terms of uh, my childhood, uh, I was fortunate. My, um, you know, we maintained very close ties with the nurses in my schools. Everyone knew what to do if my blood sugar dropped. Um, on several occasions, I remember, you know, the warning signs just weren't noticed. One, uh, for instance, we were uh, one day when I think I was in third grade. I was out playing softball. You know, remember this ball coming at my face, and I look up at the sun, and I was out for at least uh, 20 minutes, and it was scary. And fortunately, it served as a learning experience for everyone. You know, what to do when I'm <laughs> unconscious. <laughs> but um, it was uh, it was a, a it was it was tough being, I would say, a pioneer in my school for um, children with diabetes. Um, uh, over the years, you know, I would do things like go to di diabetes summer camp, which I would imagine uh, just on a legal basis must be horrifying to, to arrange something like that. Um, having, you know, 200 um, kids with syringes everywhere, but um, it was, I think it was really helpful for, for me at least um, in terms of just being around people who were, for better or worse, like me. <laughs> um, I also recall that at that camp, my blood sugar was at its 
highest and lowest that I had ever recorded up to that point. So I think I was somewhere around 500 and then 30 within mat like hours of each other. So in any event, I digress. But um, you know, over the years, uh, you know, summer camp, uh, it was always important to for my for me and my parents to go to sleepaway camp. Did eight week programs. The interesting thing, um, you know, we were talking earlier about um, uh, what happens when either uh, when when you you suddenly find out that this disease has um, you, you no longer are able to do things that everyone else can do. And I had been at a eight week summer camp for four years, and suddenly found myself being told that I couldn't go on an overnight hike um, because of my diabetes. There were concerns about di my diabetes. And I was thinking to myself, gosh, you know, just weeks earlier we had been on a hike and uh, the counselors noticed that a boy had received a uh, bee sting and uh, he was allergic to bees. And suddenly I was approached, given my experience with needles, and I was approached to give him whatever the, the, the EpiPen. And I'm thinking to myself, had I not been there, things could have been much worse. Yet at the same time, I'm being told that I am, that there are legal reasons why I can't go on an overnight hike. That was, that was tough, you know, being 12 years old and, you know, finding out that, uh, that your disease is going to limit what you want to do, uh, that was a, a learning experience. Um, let me just kind of wrap up a little quickly. Um, you know, over the years, um, I've, I kind of used that experience as a way to try to, to do new and different things. My parents, uh, growing up were just crucial in instilling a sense of independence in me, um, that I was responsible for my own, um, you know, my own future. I could do anything I wanted to do, um, but I was going to have to work for it. And, um, you know, in high school, I lived abroad for a year. In college, I spent a year living in Russia and Czech Republic. I now find myself working for some of those people, um, which is its own set of <laughs> interesting experiences. But, um, you know, now I, I just recently, within the past year and a half, um, started using an insulin pump. I had somehow managed to go 29 years without using it. And uh, when I talked with my doctor about the fact that you know, I was considering having a baby, he looked at me and said, you're going to have to test your blood sugar and take something like 15 to 20 shots a day. Your life will be so much easier if you just go on a pump. And I looked at him and said, oh, OK. And I'm, it took around six months to get used to it, but I'm fine. Um, daughter was born in April of this year. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are any number of questions that you may have about the experience of diabetes and pregnancy. Um, that was a great nine months. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a, um, you know, with the introduction of different forms of, um, you know, treatment uh, between, you know, the pump, continuous glucose monitor, um, I wouldn't say that things have become easier, but I definitely have a better way of, um, you know, being aware of what, um, ranges in what my, my sugars are doing and how my, my treatment is going. So um, with that, I'll pass it over. In listening to Lauren, I'm struck by how different her experience is from mine. Uh, she confronted it at an early age, and um, I became type 2 much later and have been in denial, denial before I had diabetes and denial since I've had diabetes. Um, I had symptoms which I uh, blamed on hot weather and other things and um, also because of the medical system my doctors keep kept dropping my insurance so I kept spending time without doctors so I also missed some opportunities uh, but since developing diabetes I've take two three medicines um, exercise more uh, watch my diet, not as much as I should, but more than I did. So I'm satisfied with some improvement. And I am struck by doctors hearing I have diabetes and suddenly that's the explanation for every disease and every symptom I present to them. And it is impossible to convince them that there's any other explanation. I actually find nurses listen better than doctors. Um, it's sort of go in there and they have a checklist. If you have three out of five criteria, then you clearly have it. If you have two, you don't. 
Um, and I guess I would argue more than doctors that diet and exercise are critical. I, I see a response to my increased exercise uh, even when the medicines don't change. And I've seen increased medicines without any changes. Uh, but then, I have no idea, honestly. But um, I guess it's probably four, four and a half years it was first diagnosed. And I suspect that I probably had it two years earlier and that I probably was borderline for maybe 10 to 15 years because I remember at least twice doctors telling me that my blood sugar was too high and then it responded to changes so I never took it very seriously. Your turn. My turn. Um, actually, pass the mic yeah, over. Course. I want to make sure everyone can um, hear me also. Um, in listening to Lauren's story, you're probably going to hear some overlap in some similar situations um, from what I experienced. Um, I was diagnosed in June of 1984. I was actually the first day of summer um, at four years old. Um, and it's, it's interesting because the only thing I remember from my diagnosis is the wallpaper in the room at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where the young patients would play. I don't really remember anything else. Um, interest um, interestingly enough, um, my blood sugar was only 120 when I was diagnosed. Um, my mother is also a long-term type 1 diabetic. Um, she'll have her 50-year anniversary um, next year. Um, and my parents are also physicians. So that made an interesting um, situation also. Essentially, at four years old, I was losing weight, and I was a pretty small uh, kid. And I started to want to nap a lot, and I never in my life wanted to nap ever. I was a very active uh, kid and I also was urinating very, very frequently. So essentially before bringing me to uh, CHOP, I, my parents had pretty much um, already diagnosed me. I wasn't hospitalized as a lot of uh, young type 1s are when first diagnosed. Um, and the honeymoon period of that when you're really not, your body isn't requiring much insulin, um, lasted uh, quite a while. Um, I definitely think my family and community helped me to have a relatively normal uh, childhood, but of course, you know, there were things I was faced with doing that my uh, peers and even my older sister, who is not um, a diabetic, didn't have to do. Um, I learned to carb count from a very young age. I was testing my blood sugar. I was, you know, helping to fill my shots, although my parents really managed my care um, for the first couple years. Um, of the disease. Um, one area that I am going to highlight is my time spent at um, Camp Sedevade, a summer camp for diabetic kids that lasted a week. And this was really the first time I'd been away from home. Um, again, having the support of medical staff who were really trained uh, for type 1s, um, having other kids my age around me who were, you know, experiencing the same things I was. It really gave me a sense of independence, and I felt like I really could control my disease. Um, there were, you know, there were really interesting activities in addition to, you know, the boating and the swimming and the hiking. We had um, sessions with our medics um, where we'd play games and learn how you would inject insulin and how it would eat up the carbs and your blood sugar would kind of be balanced or it's kind of like um, for anyone who watches Top Chef, the quick fire challenges, we would go to dietary sessions where they say, okay, make a snack of 30 grams of carbohydrate. And we would go into the kitchen, kind of raid the pantry and try and get as close to 30 grams as possible that we could. And really those kind of fun activities, um, really great and really great learning experiences. Some of the things I remember as a kid that kind of made me feel a bit different, um, Halloween was always a tough holiday as you can probably imagine. I would go around, I would do my normal trick-or-treating in my neighborhood with all of my friends, but when it came, you know, you know, my lunch was being packed the next day, I would have one Reese's peanut butter cup while well, my friends and peers would all have, you know, 10, 12 pieces of candy, whatever they wanted. So I remember that being difficult. I also, um, I started skiing at a very young age, and it always bothered me that in preparation for our breaks, my parents would have to bring diet hot chocolate. So I'd have my pack of diet hot chocolate when everyone else was, uh, you know, drinking the hot chocolate, you know, that the mountain cafes had. Um, 
another thing that that uh, stands out to me is my dad and my sister both scuba dive, and it's not suggested that diabetics scuba dive. And every time you have to sign a waiver, even to get trained, that got a little messy. So that's that's one thing I remember not being able to do. Wow. That because they would be nervous that if your sugar would go low because of water pressure and what not under under there, you may not notice it, and it would be a huge liability for them. Essentially, it's on them. And I think it's also, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but oh, no. I think it has something to do with, um, like if you're down at that depth and, and um, you are unconscious, they have no way of knowing if it's a night, um, what's the thing when you get the bends? No, they don't know if it's no. the bends or if it's diabetes related. Excuse me? Yes. Um, and oddly, I was actually certified, I was thinking about it, but I was, um, I became certified for scuba diving, and then later had an incidence like what you're talking about, so. Interesting. So um, I also remember, so I, for the first, I guess, for the, basically the first 12 years of living with the disease, I wasn't on a pump, I was on insulin regimen and uh, injections. Um, in high school, um, I decided to go on the pump. Um, and. I'm actually not on the pump any longer. I was on the pump for about four years. And for me, I didn't like having a machine attached to me all the time. Now, how is that really different from how I now have my cell phone attached to me all the time? I don't know. But at the time, I didn't like it. And I remember one incident. I was sitting in my uh, history class freshman year of high school. And my pump would um, kind of, an alarm would be set off if my insulin cartridge reached under a certain level. And it couldn't be silenced. So you could silence it, but it would keep going. So I'm sitting there in history class. And um, my, my teacher is getting really angry. We weren't allowed to have cell phones. He didn't understand what was beeping. And he basically said to the class, if someone doesn't turn off their cell phone, I'm going to throw it out the window. And that really bothered me. Uh, one of my good friends at the time said, she's a diabetic. It's her insulin pump, and you should shut up. <laughs> and it was it, it was really great, and that was um, I remember that situation pretty vividly. So an area that I do uh, want to talk to uh, talk about is through high school, um, and although it's not clinically diagnosed, but it's kind of a coined phrase called diabulimia, where essentially diabetics don't take their insulin in order to help them purge sugar and urinate and lose weight. And I went through about. A, with this um, in high school. And you know, some teenagers dabble with alcohol or you know, various other, um, various other things. And my form of teenage rebellion was uh, to go through this. And that um, there's a long, there's a blood test called the hemoglobin A1C um, that really me can measure um, kind of how you've been doing, how your sugars have been doing over the last two to three months. My A1C at the time was 18. A good A1C is six. So it's very, very, very dangerous. I um, had a bout of ketoacidosis with this. I was hospitalized. Um, I guess it was around Thanksgiving of my junior year of high school. Um, and it was really a big struggle um, to be a young woman. Um, and now, of course, during adolescence and lots of hormonal changes, your body often requires much larger doses of insulin than you otherwise would have taken or will take in the future. Um, and that, with, um, with me, did cause me to gain some weight. Um, through this not properly taking my insulin, I figured out that I was very quickly able to lose the weight um, and struggled with that for a bit. Um, and it was very interesting considering kind of my parents' background and watching them kind of me do this essentially right under their eyes. Now, my sister had studied abroad in Australia in college. And my parents had been in Australia for three weeks. My grandparents were staying with me. And I remember it was those three weeks where I really um, lost a lot of weight and really uh, got very sick. And uh, it was about a week after my parents were back that I had the A1C done. It was super high. The truth kind of came out to my parents what was going on. And um, shortly thereafter, I actually did go to the hospital with DKA. So the kind of recovering with that, I, you know, I saw a psychologist. I really had to delve into what was going on in my head. And basically, I, at the time, was, um, 
I was a tennis player. I had an excellent season. I wasn't seeing things around. Uh, having experienced things around me go bad the way you would think of someone who is really lethargic and tired and urinating and really not 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 there all the time. Um, but I really had to make a big decision. If I wanted to go away to college, I had applied early to Syracuse. I had been accepted. Um, I was really going to have to get this under control. And I worked very, very hard and got my A1C down under 10 prior to going away to school and um, was lucky because there was a Jocelyn Clinic um, up at Syracuse, and I was hooked up with a really great endocrinologist who helped me really improve um, improve my care over the next four years. Um, so I think that was really um, an important uh, time for me. Um, one other thing that I want to kind of make note of is it was at Syracuse for the first time that I had was around other diabetics my age, of course, since my experience at camp. Um, and what I never wanted was to be, hi, I'm a diabetic, and by the way, my name is Judy. I always wanted people to know me first before my disease. Um, so that was also interesting. And it's um, for me, I do think um, someday when I, well, probably in the next five or so years when I do want to have children, I will go back on the insulin pump. Um, but for now, my insulin regimen uh, tries to mock that of a pump, and it's working pretty well for me. So um, that's, that's pretty much my history. Well, thank you all very, very much. Um, what questions do you have for our panelists? This question is for you, Mr. Lubovich, here. Um, I want you to talk about your experience with insurance. May I ask, have you been a freelancer for a while? Kind yes. Of your, okay. Um, can you talk about that particular aspect of, of dealing with insurance and, right. and handling your care, particularly uh, if diabetes was considered like pre-existing and you had particular struggles once switching companies if that ever happened for you. Okay. Uh, my insurance is through my wife. And the um, switching the doctors I referred to was basically uh, the doctors kept changing health plans. And so um, I would then switch doctors or I had a couple of doctors. One moved out of the area. One went to a, a concierge practice. So I could, I could have found other doctors, but I sort of enjoyed a year, year and a half of not going to doctors, <laughs> paying the cost now. Did I answer your question? You did. Okay. Um, Marie, I had a question for you. You mentioned you were certified. I'm a dye master, and I, I never consider problems of diabetes with, with scuba diving, with other issues, yes, but not with diabetes. Tell me your experience. Sure. Um, it was actually, you know, kind of following up on the, the what I had mentioned earlier about the summer camp and the, the hike they wouldn't let me go on. So the next summer I went to, I had, had two stints where I was able to go on exchange programs to France. And so oddly enough, I became certified for scuba diving in a pool in the middle of France, <laughs> which was kind of interesting. Um, went for my first dives off the, the you know, coast in um, Mediterranean, you know, fantastic experience unlike any that anyone I know growing up ever had. But um, the next summer I went with, um, I actually went on a trip that was sponsored by the National Aquarium in Baltimore. And we went to, um, uh, I think it was, I don't know if it was sponsored by or it was with people who were affiliated with the group. It was at a club med in somewhere in the at Caribbean. And um, got there, you know, I had all of my fancy new gear. I was excited. and. I went up to the front desk and said, I need a refrigerator in my room to put my insulin in, or I, I need access to a refrigerator where I can get my insulin before I go on the dives. And I was then told, what do you mean before you go on the dives? And I said, well, I'm here with this group, you know, why I'm going on the dives. And they said, oh, no, you're not going on the dives. And I literally was then for like five days left by myself um, because they would not permit me to get on the boat and go. Um, which was interesting because I had, I think, received the initial certification and then was 
you know, recertified. And they just said that the liability issues were too much and that um, they couldn't. Oh, but you didn't have any problems with the liability. No, I had no problems. They were just, they just told me liability, liability, liability. And I said, uh, I'm certified. I have, like. Well, how many times did you I, on, on that particular trip, I didn't. I, I think I'd been on, um, I think at that point I'd probably done like 10 or 15. So. So you never went to the, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, honestly, it was, I, it was probably like 15, 20 years ago. So I can't really remember. But um, I, there, there was never an instance where I had like come out of the water and said, I'm dizzy. I don't know if it's because of nitrogen issues or if it was diabetes related. So. I had always tested my blood sugar before, you know, made sure to eat a snack, gone on the dive, come back, tested my blood sugar immediately after. So uh, there was a, there was never an instance where I had made people believe that um, diabetes was a factor in, in dives. So, um, I'd like to ask all three of you about your diet and how strict it is. Like, can you say to yourself, I have an urge to go to Five Guys and have a delicious burger and greasy fries? Is that once a year, once a month, never? Uh, how, how can you indulge yourself personally and also suppose you're out with a group of friends and everybody is ordering, you know, a big appetizer that's greasy? Oh. I'll start. <laughs> um, it's funny you should mention Five Guys because it is one of my boyfriend's favorite, um, favorite places to eat. Um, so for me, I tend to eat a low-carb, high, lean-protein veggie diet. Um, and that has kind of been how it's been for a while. Um, if I do want to go to Five Guys, I try and, you know, I can either look up, you know, what the carb count, what the calorie count is online before going. Um, I used to live in New York where calories were always posted, um, and they are here sometimes too. And I would pretty much just, you know, see what my sugar is and cover for that amount of carbohydrate. Um, I tend to not eat that type of food very often, but if I want it, I will allow myself to have it. Um, the only thing I gave up was Coca-Cola. Um, everything else I've been reducing the amount of ice cream, um, less hamburgers and fries, less sub sandwiches, but, but still more than I should. We're not going to we're not going to let you get away with such a short answer because I think it's a really good question, and particularly as someone who was only diagnosed in the last five years, how difficult has it been for you to um, educate yourself in terms of the number of carbs and calories in various foods? I mean, these women have been lived with it their whole lives. They they've grown up with it, so it's probably instinctive by now to kind of have a sense at least of where you are. And, and Lauren, you can talk about that in a minute. But um, Bill, do you, you're not uh, injecting insulin, you're just on medication. So do you have to alter the amount of your medication or do you know that you have to do extra exercise? How do you sort of compensate when you eat something that you know isn't ideal? Um, a longer answer since you asked for it. I do remember going into a, um, um, a spicy uh, fried chicken place, and it was in Montgomery County, so they posted all the calories and the content, and I walked out. I was flabbergasted. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, I've noticed that I will eat more of something that's... Um, not healthy because I'm just so sure I'm going to go out and exercise later in the day. I'm basically playing a game with myself that I know that the next day my uh, blood glucose will be low and then it turns out not to be. I mean, I cannot predict what my blood glucose will be. So that um, basically what I'm trying to do is just reduce the portions and um, I'll eat more salads than I ever ate. Um, I'm from New England. I love Italian subs. And maybe that would have been something once a week. Maybe now it's once a month. Um, I do eat less hamburger. Uh, I do go to McDonald's occasionally. And um, I eat a lot less ice cream. I grew up on ice cream being in New England. Um, I love eating. 
I love eating everything. I just am, uh, when you talk about foodies, that's what I am, that's what I grew up with. I remember when I was very young, you know, even though I had diabetes, every night before bed, my dad and I would sit and have a bowl of ice cream. I don't know if it was a daddy-daughter thing, what was going on, but uh, that was just something I remember from growing up. Um, I would say that uh, on the counting carbs side of things, it. For me, I, I did it. I didn't really, I don't know if I was, I didn't do it well. Um, it wasn't really until I was pregnant when I became, I, I was absolutely terrified. I literally spent nine months being terrified of everything. Every time my blood sugar was higher than 120, I was terrified if I ate something and some, you know, if my pump wasn't hooked up properly. It just, the entire thing scared me. Um, I think what's interesting though is that over time, once you start to really learn how to count carbs, you you realize that like an English muffin is a very different breakfast from a bagel. And it took me like 25 years to realize that. Um, I just realized that you know if I eat an English muffin, I can eat again in a couple of hours. If I have a bagel, it, that thing's in my system for you know eight hours. So um, that was uh, anyway. So uh, th for me, I think it was really the pregnancy that uh, just brought a lot of things to light in terms of eating, so. So, so Bill, you, you, you know, forgive me, but you seem to be sort of like a little bit less affair about having diabetes, and you talked about being in denial at first. And so, um, you know, knowing all you do about the complications later on and stuff, what do you think is sort of like, you know, will happen as time goes on? I mean, it, it, these two women had parents who were physicians and, a lot of education through the years. Do you think it's just like you're, you haven't gotten enough because of insurance, or you know, do, do you think you're doing a really good job controlling the diabetes? Do you think you have to do better? Do you feel better when you're taking better care of yourself? Like, um, I feel nothing, um, regardless of how high or how low my glucose is. I just don't feel a difference. Um, so I'm depending on the. Um, testing to see how well I'm doing. Um, and um, I do see an endocrinologist and nephrologist and assorted other doctors and they tell me how well I'm doing or not doing. And so that's my guidance. Um, Laissez-faire probably describes my attitude towards life. So it's not, <laughs> it's not just diabetes, uh, for better or worse. Um, and I was listening to the previous speaker, and it was depressing the hell out of me, because I don't want to think about the side effects of diabetes. And um, what I'll do is I'll go home and I'll eat half the bagel instead of the whole bagel and things like that. Um, and to answer an earlier question, to Susan's question, um, I have a lot of trouble remembering how much something is unhealthy for me and how many carbohydrates and things like that. So I'm not good at that, and that contributes. So it's trying to control through volume. But actually exercise. I mean, I have a bad knee. I have two bad knees, and I shouldn't be running. Um, but I've decided that whatever happens to the knees is less harmful than the side effects of diabetes. So I run and bicycle and lift weights to control my diabetes to the degree I can. Um, I'm wondering if any of you have had some of the kind of downstream complications like, you know, terrible infections, um, peripheral vascular problems or anything like that. I do know somebody who had his leg amputated last year. He had a massive infection. He was in the hospital for ages. And um, he was, you know, actually a college professor. And I mean, he almost didn't make it. And his good leg was amputated. And I'm sort of interested in one, um, you know, because it seems like it takes a while to get to that point. I mean, you know, with smoking, there's all this stuff. Well, we should show these people this horrible stuff. Do you think that's any kind of a motivator, or do you think also when somebody gets, has that happen, is it like everybody looks at them like, you just don't know how to take care of yourself? 
you know, you're as bad as like a cigarette smoker, you know, et cetera. I'm, I'm kind of interested in that. I actually, and I wasn't sure I was going to talk about this or not, but I actually have retinopathy, um, and I'm 26 years old, and that's quite young, um, and it most likely is kind of the abuse I put on my body um, through a couple of my teen years. I've had two vitrectomies. I don't have vitreous, vitrei in either eye, um, and that was basically happening because I was having bleeds that were then suspended in the gel and weren't dissipating. Um, so that was definitely a wake-up call to me. And I was actually just diagnosed with the retinopathy um, the summer I graduated from college. So that's a relatively recent thing. Um, and I, even through my college years, was very rigorous about my care. Um, and post-college, have gotten even more um, neurotic about things. Um, so it definitely. And I, I mean, I know for like, friends and family and other, you know, young people I know with diabetes, that's also kind of been a shock and kind of a wake-up call to them as well. Anyone else want to speak to that? Um, I've had some symptoms like the first step with the eyes when they do a, an exam, they see blood vessels or something or blood, and then they disappear, and I go off in my merry way. Um, and I have... Um, some, uh, whenever I go to an orthopedic surgeon for anything but my knees, whatever is the problem, diabetes. So it's called frozen shoulder, and that's supposed to be caused by diabetes. Um, carpal tunnel syndrome is supposed to be caused by diabetes. So I hear this all the time. Um, I've, I'm very lucky. I have no complications related to diabetes. Um, it's funny, one of, uh, an, Ophthalmologist, that's the yeah. okay. <laughs> um, I, he was looking at my eyes at one point, and he said, "Well, you know, doing this exam, I can tell that you have diabetes." But um, he just he looked at me and said, "If he said genes play a role, if up to this point you don't have um, complications, so I, you know, I, I credit a lot of this to to luck at this point. I, I just I think I've been very fortunate." Um, you know, to your point about whether or not, I think you had mentioned something about, you know, does it help to kind of pub maybe publicize stories of people who have complications? I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I personally find it, um, I personally find it a little challenging to be sitting at a benefit dinner where, you know, the special appeal comes out and it's some story, a story of just absolute horror and I, I I would like to be at those dinners where I hear about people who've been successful, and you can basically reassure um, families. I mean, new par parents who have children with this disease, it's scary. I mean, you literally, your life is turned upside down. And for me personally, I think if I was in a new parent's <clears throat> shoes and was dealing with this, I would want to know that my kid can be pretty normal and live an easy life. Um, it's going to be tough, but... Um, you're just going to have to figure out what the balance is. So, Bill, I was I was curious why you think that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you were pre-diabetic for about ten years before you became diabetic. Just what, looking back, yeah. what you see in your life that um, causes you to think that. This panel and Susan's questions forced me to think about this okay. more than I like to, <laughs> and so I remembered approximately 10 and approximately 15 years ago, going to the doctor, having the routine blood test, and being told that your sugar is higher than it should be. I don't think they use the word pre-diabetic, but they sure as hell hinted that's where I was going. And then I um, cut back on the Coca-Cola and the ice cream. I mean, I really like ice cream. <laughs> and, uh, so that's, that's it. There is no history in my family of diabetes. Today they mentioned something I didn't know and the relationship with depression. Have any of you suffered of depression because of diabetes? Or do you want to ask the question, are any of us depressed? <laughs> <laughs> um, I had never heard that either, but it's possible. I have my moods that aren't great. 
I think struggling as a teenager with this disease, I'm sure I was depressed. And I don't know, you know, if that was clinically diagnosed or not. But um, it's a very heavy burden to have on your shoulders no matter what. And as, um, as the last speaker mentioned, you know, it's always on. There's no vacation from this disease. And I don't know how, you know, <laughs> hearing the statistics and kind of the course that the disease may or may not take, how that can't be depressing. I think that's pretty depressing information to get, so. Do you have, um, I, run a I write a blog called Patient POV, and the concept is really that there are stories that are not being told from patients' you know, perspective to get away from the cliches and that sort of thing. And I'm interested in what you think you would, you would want in a doctor. Someone who spends more than 45 seconds before deciding on his or her diagnosis. I actually think I found that doctor in New York. Um, and I'm actually continuing my care with the doc, with my endocrinologist in New York and primary uh, here. Um, I want someone who also spends time with patients, so has wonderful bedside manner, and also really thinks outside of the box and is up to date on all the new technologies. Um, I recently started on a metformin type drug, um, and it's a type 1 diabetic because he's suspecting after 24 years with this disease, I might be coming a bit insulin resistant. It's helped me to cut down on my long-acting insulin, um, and I've been so appreciative. Um, and seeing him for the last four years has really um, been a really good thing for me. I will echo that. Um, I had an endocrinologist who was proud of the fact that he didn't prescribe the newest drugs out because this is when they were having uh, these um, announcements that these drugs were dangerous. They led to heart attacks and other things. And he said to me, you know, I've never prescribed any of these. And he was very critical of other endocrinologists because he felt they followed whatever the new trend was. You know, they, they'd go to a conference, someone would give a paper, and then they'd run home and prescribe all their patients. And he was a good listener. He, but I noticed that he was also on his computer at the same time, and that some things I said he didn't hear at all. I, in, gosh, 30 years, have had two endocrinologists, which I, it's probably unheard of. I, maybe it's not, but um, I, I've just been incredibly lucky. Um, I had a pediatric endocrinologist at Johns Hopkins, and then uh, my current doctor I've had for, you know, 11 years. I think with both of them, uh, just they, they spend, you know, an, an hour at a time, an hour at a time with me when I go in for appointments every, you know, three or four months. Which I, I, there's a reason probably why I don't have a uh, general physician. That, you know, I just kind of go to them for whatever I need. Um, it's just to kind of give an example of what was important with both of them. Um, for my pediatric endocrinologist, she kind of developed a novel technique of of um, helping children with diabetes. She would, you know, kind of have the child and the parent in the room together. They'd talk through what would be going on, and then she would look at the parent and say, bye. And, you know, for 15 minutes it was me talking to the doctor and, you know, really helping her have a better understanding of what the uh, care situation was like. With my current doctor, I have his cell number. You know, when I was having issues in the hospital with the pregnancy, when, you know, the they told me that I couldn't use my pump and liability, liability, liability. Um, uh, he got in his car at midnight, came into the hospital, and basically gave everyone a, a lesson in what diabetes and pregnancy is. And so I, just I, I'm, if I ever had a problem, those would be the two people I would call. I want to add one point. Um, it's indirectly relevant. Most of the endocrinologists that have been recommended to me did not take medical insurance. And actually, following up on that, um, my current endocrinologist for a period of, I think, five or six years, he grew so tired of dealing with the insurance companies that he decided it was better for his long-term knowledge of the disease just to stop asking his patients to pay. And so he had, I think, a group of, I don't whatever his roster of patients, he stopped taking new patients, but he just said, come in and see me. I just, I don't want to deal with insurance anymore. So different approach, but. Well, what did that mean, though? Did he, did he t charge less? He did research. No, he just oh, didn't charge us. So. It's not 
a solution you could recommend. <laughs> what? <Other breeders. laughs> no, but I, well, of course, it's not something that ever happens. It's I've never heard of anything like it. But it was, um, you know, it was a uh, he. That was his experience with insurance was that it wasn't worth it. Well, um, Judy, something that you you touched upon. Um, so I, I presume your current boyfriend knows you're diabetic. Right? Yeah. So, you know, when you're in a, a, a long-term, you know, loving relationship or even with a spouse, Bill, um, so how do you know when to tell somebody that you do have a chronic disease and something's That's wrong? That's very interesting. You bring up a really uh, good point. Uh, it's interesting because prior to Rob, and we've been dating for about two years, and this probably is the one for me, um, my ex-boyfriend, I actually didn't tell him because I I was a diabetic until we'd been seeing each other on and off for about two years um, because, and this I think relates back to how I've at times felt that this um, this diet, this disease marks me and makes me different and, you know, makes me perhaps not as marketable. Um, so that's interesting. And with Rob, um, it was about six months into our relationship um, and I remember we were at home visiting my parents. And it was pretty late at night, and my blood sugar was going low. And I said, can you go down and get me some orange juice? And he was like, of course. And I was like, do you know why I, this sometimes happens? And he was like, you're a diabetic. I never told him. But of course, after spending that much time with someone, you see their habits. You know, he sees me go to the bathroom after eating to take insulin and, you know, kind of sneaking aside to test my blood sugar. Um, so that's a good question for me. I think it's once you, you reach that. And I also think that um, through adolescence, it's difficult. And as you get older, you get more comfortable in your own skin and you're kind of confident in who you are. And I think it took me getting there also. And, and Bill, what's happening in, in your life if you're like, you know, on your case about the diabetes or? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, does she eat your, does she? Uh, we really need to have microphone folks. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Oh. Sorry? Do you eat the same diet? Yes. Um, and Lauren mentioned that she's a foodie. Her family are foodies. And I'm the only non-foodie in my family. So um, I eat the same things. Yes. Last question. Um, I, I wanted to follow up. Uh, you got asked what, what would you like in a doctor. Uh, what would you like in larger policy? I mean. Uh, through through whatever accident of birth, all of you have had wonderful care and knowledgeable parents for for you ladies, but for uh, for the spate of diabetics coming up who may be the first ones in their families who may come from economic situations where they can't go to doctors who won't charge them, where they can't afford the taxi to get to a doctor, um, whatnot. With your varying levels of, of understanding of the disease, and particularly for what younger people might not know that they're going to need to know, what policy issues do you think could, should be looked into um, as far as implementation to help those along who are, who are going to become diabetic and going to have issues later? Yeah. <laughs> when I was in college, I was a volunteer testing uh, people, children for lead poisoning in Boston. And I was through the Boston City Hospital, which is affiliated with BU and some other medical schools. And what they did is they went into community centers in Boston, uh, essentially through uh, public health and nurses, testing kids and educating kids. And so there wasn't the visit to the hospital or visit to the private doctor to identify and I would think something like that would be helpful. Anyone else have any thoughts about <clears throat> public policy? <laughs> it's okay, you don't have to. <laughs> we didn't put you up as policy experts. I want to thank each of you. Uh, we have a certificate of appreciation for you, Lauren. Thank you. And Bill. Thank you. And Judy. And a round of applause. <laughs>